Okay. Um, when Sellers was asked what he hoped the effect of his work would be uh, by Rorty, he responded that uh, he hoped it would help usher analytic philosophy from its Humean phase into its Kantian phase. Rorty recounts this uh, self-characterization in his preface to uh, our edition of Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind, and <clears throat> um, a couple of pages later, uh, generously describes my aspirations for my work as uh, ushering analytic philosophy from its <coughs> incipient Kantian phase to its ultimate eventual Hegelian phase. And I think both of those characterizations are right. That's uh, what Sellers did slash wanted to do, and that's sort of my aspiration as the next turn of the crank. Um, Sellers was concerned with Kant for his entire philosophical career. Um, <clears throat> he thought Kant had not been understood, and um, it was only late in Sellers' life that Kant was readmitted to the analytic canon. Um, the Moore and Russell, who in many ways um, created the ideology, the fighting faith of analytic philosophy, were both recoiling from uh, the version of Hegel that their British idealist teachers had conveyed to them. Uh, and though they didn't know much about Hegel, they knew that he was uh, an enthusiastic and committed reader of Kant. And they perceived, I think, presciently that uh, one couldn't open the door to the canon wide enough to let Kant in and slam it quickly enough to keep Hegel out. And since Hegel getting in was the great bed as far as they were concerned, they saw the idealist rot as already having set in with Kant uh, and thought that the history of philosophy as it mattered for Anglophone philosophy should pass directly from Leibniz to Mill and Frege without passing through the oxbow of German idealism. And it wasn't really until uh, the late 60s and early 70s, uh, due to Strawson uh, on the theoretical side and Rawls on the practical side, uh, that Kant really came to be taken as centrally important in uh, Anglophone analytic philosophy. Uh, I know from where we sit, it's sort of hard to imagine that. Uh, for, for one reason, it, it's hard to think of a more analytic philosopher than Kant. The, the definitions, the arguments, the subdivisions, and so on. How could they not have seen? And f as a philosopher of science, is that is a central thing. Why, why, why couldn't someone like Carnap see the, um, see the affiliations? But they didn't. And Sellers was very much a, a voice in the wilderness for, for all of this uh, time, trying to, to bring uh, Kantian wine to the masses by putting it in bottles that wouldn't frighten them. Uh, uh, but uh, what is it about Kant that mattered so much to him? I think there's four ideas, um, two of which are absolutely central, uh, and one of which is fairly important, uh, and the other of which he did, didn't make a whole lot of. Uh, so let me try and say what Kant's big ideas uh, are. So the first one is, 
his normative turn, his normative understanding of intentionality or discursiveness. Now, the word discursive we really get from Kant, at least in the way I'm going to use it. Uh, discursive means of or pertaining to concept use, uh, as Kant defines it. Um, discursive practice, linguistic uh, practice. Um, Kant saw, I will say, endorsing this as an insight, that what distinguishes judgment um, on the cognitive side and intentional agency on the practical side um, from the habitual or learned responses of merely natural creatures is not, as the Kantian tradition had it, that mind stuff is involved in these processes, that cognition brings about mental events and in agency mental events bring about other things. It had nothing to do with an ontology of mindedness. What distinguishes judgments and intentional doings is that they're things the doers, the agents, the knowers, are in a distinctive sense responsible for. They express commitments of those knowers uh, and agents. They're exercises of the authority of those knowers and agents in a distinctive sense of authority. Specifically, it is the authority that we have to make ourselves responsible. And this normative appreciation of, this appreciation of the normative significance of what would come to be called intentional states. Uh, this is something that he shares with the later Wittgenstein, though it's very hard to draw a line between the Kantian insight and Wittgenstein's version of it. Um, but the puzzles that Wittgenstein offers us uh, along the way to trying to dissolve the presuppositions that make these phenomena puzzling in the distinctive way they are, uh, center around the normative significance of beliefs, desires, intentions, and so on. So a characteristic <coughs> sort of Wittgensteinian anecdote will be how uh, <clears throat> you're visiting a friend uh, and the mother says, uh, asks you, would, would you teach the children a game? I, I have to uh, do an errand to teach the children a game. And she comes back an hour later and you and the kids are on your knees rolling dice for money. And she says, I didn't mean that kind of a game. And Wittgenstein says, and, and what she says is exactly true. She did not mean that kind of a game. But what kind of a fact is that? Oh, uh, she need not at the time have thought, oh, well, of course, I don't mean gambling or games of chance, no doubt she didn't consciously make that reservation. Uh, and yet, he wants to say, it's true that she did not mean that kind of a game. Somehow her, now I'm filling in, uh, somehow her request reached out normatively to the different responses you could have and made some of them correct, some of them responsive to the request, some of them fulfilling, counting as correctly fulfilling the request, and others not. 
and this one wasn't. So I say she did not mean that kind of a game. Her request, the, the normative division it made between appropriate and inappropriate responses had this on the other side. Even though she didn't explicitly rehearse this reservation, and even though the words she uttered teach the children a game, are satisfied by what you did. Those are just two features of the case. <clears throat> and Wittgenstein's overall point is, if you find that puzzling, that nonetheless, it's true that uh, what you did was not appropriate, an appropriate response to her request, then you're in the grip of the kind of picture, uh, ultimately a Cartesian picture, but in a very broad sense, uh, that he's after. What sort of thing is it? Well, it's what there is to a signpost over and above the signpost considered just as a piece of wood. And what's that? Well, that's not anything that's between anybody's ears. It has to do with the customs, the uses, the institutions, the practices of following uh, uh, a sign and of responding to requests. And it's something about that practice that includes how it's appropriate to treat children, what the circumstances was uh, were of the mother and so on, that made that not an appropriate response to her request. And it doesn't need to have been reflected in what anybody was thinking. OK, I'm just saying all of this not to you know, pretend that all of Wittgenstein is here, but just to, to sort of remind you, yeah, he does this sort of thing all the time, right? Uh, that this is a central concern of his. And it is about the normative significance of uh, an intention say what was her intention or of your uh, belief in response or of just the content of the request uh, that she made. So <clears throat> Kant has this idea that the distinction between us and it uh, isn't an ontological distinction of mind stuff. It's a deontological distinction between those of us who are subject to normative assessment and stuff that isn't. And this insight puts the question of oh, the nature of that normativity at front and center, philosophically. Now, downstream oh, from this insight, are many of Kant's most uh, distinctive innovations. So where the tradition, as I've said, starts with concepts and builds judgments out of them, Kant says the minimum unit of awareness or experience is the judgment. And you have to understand concepts as functions of judgment, that is, in terms of the role they play in judgment. Why judgments? Because that's the minimal unit you can take responsibility for. And we see that articulated sort of at the next level of uh, fineness of grain <clears throat> in the subjective and objective forms of judgment. The subjective form of judgment, the I think, which can accompany all of our representations, and so is the emptiest. It's merely formal. That's the mark of who is responsible for the judgment. I think it's my commitment. The objective form of the judgment, the object equals x, he says, uh, that's the mark of what you've made yourself responsible to. What you're representing is what uh, sets the standard that determines the correctness or incorrectness of your judgment. It, it's in virtue of your having made yourself responsible 
four assessments of the correctness of your judgment, two, what you count as thereby talking about or representing, in virtue of which your judgment counts as a, a representing of something. That relation between representing and represented, it's a normative relation of your being responsible to the thing that has authority over your judgings in the sense that it sets the standard for assessments of correctness. That's its authority, that's your responsibility. So this uh, notion of the normative character of uh, our intentional states, this is, this is the axis around which all of Kant's thought revolves. And hardly anyone saw this. Uh, the people who did, well, I mean, I think Hegel did, but then people misunderstood Hegel. It was a theme in German neo-Kantianism, uh, but it was lost essentially from them until Wittgenstein again. But Sellers saw it and took it as you know, setting a central philosophical problematic. Uh, I don't want to get too deep into the Kantian weeds, but does Sellers kind of skirt the whole question of transcendental idealism, which is often taken to be fully argued for in the aesthetic, um, where this, all we're talking about right now seems to be located in the, the deduction and the understanding and all of that. So where exactly does the aesthetic end? We're going to just say that that's where the whole argument for transcendental idealism is argued for and originates. Where well, I'll get around to where it's sort of the transcendental idealism uh, uh, comes in. But I mean, the specific answer to your question is chapter one of Science and Metaphysics. Uh, that that's his reading of the transcendental aesthetic. And uh, small anecdote. Uh, well. So that was the first of Sellers' Locke lectures. Um, and 400 people came to that lecture, including uh, a, the bewildered undergraduate John McDowell, <laughs> who claimed not to have understood a word that he uttered, but, but to have been fascinated uh, by it. Uh, the next five lectures, had no more than 10 people in the cavernous uh, auditorium. Uh, and there's a sense in which Wilfred never got over this uh, experience. I'll say a little bit something more about that later on. When, uh, a decade or so ago, uh, John's student from his Oxford days, Akhil Bilgrami, uh, then uh, chair of the Columbia Department, where he still uh, is, uh, invited John to give the Woodbridge Lectures at Columbia. Uh, it was all agreed, the time was agreed, and uh, six weeks before, Akhil uh, called up John and said, well, so what's the topic going to be? And he said, oh, I'm going to talk about uh, chapter one of Seller's Science and Metaphysics in relation to Kant's Transcendental Aesthetic. Would that be okay? And Akhil said, oh, well, of course, it's okay, whatever you want, but I'm so glad you told me. I'll book a much smaller room. <laughs> uh, and, and I should say, uh, having spent a good part of a lifetime studying Seller's, I never understood anything about that chapter of okay. science and metaphysics until John, uh, I don't know, clued me in about it. And I still wouldn't say I understand it, but I at least have some idea what's, what's going on there. So Sellers has really detailed uh, understandings of uh, lots of this stuff. Um, now, the second big Kantian idea, I would say, um, is his turning of Rousseau's 
definition of freedom into a criterion of demarcation for the normative. This is Kant's now, not Sellers. Uh, indeed, this is the idea. See, Sellers makes something of this, but it's not really a central idea for him. Rousseau uh, said, obedience to a law one lays down for oneself is freedom. And it's because of that sentence alone that the only decoration in Kant's study was a picture of Rousseau. It was in homage to that insight of his, that obedience to a law one has laid down for oneself is freedom. But Kant turned that around and used it to distinguish constraint by norms from constraint by power. One is genuinely normatively constrained, Kant thinks, only by norms one has laid, one has bound oneself by, only by laws one has given oneself. This is his autonomy uh, idea. He puts it, uh, one of the expressions of this is that where natural things are bound by rules in the form of laws, we are bound by our conceptions of rules, uh, by our attitudes towards rules. We bind ourselves by endorsing these norms, which only become normatively binding on us insofar as we acknowledge them as binding on us. What Sellers does make of this idea, of this Kantian idea, we'll see in some reflections on language games uh, two, two weeks from now. Uh, but this was Kant's answer to the question, well, what is this normative that you were talking about, his autonomy idea, that um, our normative statuses depend on our attitudes toward them. That unless you acknowledge a norm as binding, it isn't normatively binding on you. Okay. Second idea that is, sorry, I'm up to the third idea. The second idea that is of Kant's that is absolutely central for sellers is his revolutionary idea that in addition to concepts whose principal expressive job it is to describe and explain empirical goings on, besides those descriptive and explanatory concepts, there are concepts whose principal, principal expressive task it is to make explicit features of the framework that makes description and explanation possible. And he called those categories. Pure concepts of the understanding. Pure, knowable a priori in the sense that because what they're making explicit is the framework that within which alone it's possible to apply any ground level concepts in description and explanation, in applying those ground level concepts, one already knows how to do everything one knows and <coughs> needs to know how to do to deploy these categorical concepts because they're just making explicit what's implicit in the use of any descriptive or explanatory, empirical or practical concepts. This idea of the categories, of there being this other set of concepts, framework explicating concepts, I mean, I'm putting all this in my terminology downstream from Sellers rather than in Kant's, but you should recognize this uh, 
in Kant. And this was his response, the form of his response to him, who asked how we could understand the modal force of laws in terms of their origin of their modal umphiness and experience, he couldn't see how we could. And Kant's answer is, it's part of the framework that makes any of the descriptive concepts mean what they mean, is that they stand in law-like relations to one another. The title of one of Seller's 1949 articles is, Concepts as Involving Laws and Inconceivable Without Them. For Kant, oh, a lethic modality, that necessity, the, the fact that empirical properties stand in necessary relations to one another, that's an essential feature of them being determinately contentful at all. I'll say parenthetically, this is not the category of modality in uh, the table of the categories. It's hypothetical judgments, um, which are subjunctively robust uh, conditionals. Uh, that, that's what's categorial here. But uh, that was the key idea. And I want to say, although Kant thought that the step from that to synthetic a priori judgments uh, was a short and immediate step. And Sellers, by and large, follows him in that. Uh, I think those are two quite different ideas. And I want to recommend taking the first step and not the second, uh, except in an extremely Pickwickian sense of synthetic a uh, judgments. Uh, but this idea of the categories, um, as I want to put it, framework explicating concepts, this is a huge idea. And when Sellers talks about ushering analytic philosophy from its Humean into its Kantian phase, this is what he means. He means putting the idea of the categories front and center, thinking about this as a role that some concepts, in particular lethic modal concepts, play. Not as describing the structure of the modal multiverse, not as describing a universe of possible worlds. That's assimilating modal expressions to descriptive expressions, not seeing them as playing this other expressive role that Sellers saw Kant as putting on the table. And the division between a Humean way of thinking and a Kantian way of thinking about modality is whether you take seriously categorical status in some form as opposed to it being descriptive of anything. Uh, laws of nature are not super facts, is a slogan uh, here in the vicinity. When you state a law of nature, you're not describing anything about the world. That's the, the thought. What are you doing? Well, it's a transposed expression of a rule of inference in virtue of which the things involved in the law of nature have the content that they do. That's the, the picture. So the normative uh, turn and this notion of the categories, these are absolutely central Kantian ideas and they're the ones that Sellers seeks to bring up to date, to develop, uh, and to use to understand questions that, that we have, maybe that Kant didn't, but still those that he did. Uh, 
that's part of the historical background of, I hope you can see some of the passages that we read as uh, sort of expressing this. Another Kantian idea uh, which was important to Sellers, uh, the distinction between phenomena and noumena in the context of his transcendental idealism, and here's where I'm trying to come back around to uh, this point, Kant radicalized Here's a description of Kant. I, I would like to remain neutral as to whether it's a description of Kant, but it, it, whether this is fair to Kant or not. But um, he can be understood as radicalizing the distinction between <coughs> primary and secondary qualities that particularly the empiricist tradition inherited ultimately due to Galileo, um, who he wouldn't have thought would have been in this business, but um, as part of his view that um, the book of nature is written in the language of geometry, uh, he said, well, that's what's really there, the, the primary qualities and you know, the stuff we experience, that's due to us or our interaction with that. It's not what's really there. And Kant can be understood as radicalizing that and challenging us to understand the division of labor between what's out there and our faculties. What features of the way things appear to us, of our experience, are the things we're experiencing responsible for? And what features of them are our faculties responsible for? Uh, let's divide the labor and say, what, what's a reflection of us uh, when uh, Galileo sees the book of nature written in the language of geometry after in the language of mathematics more generally. Uh, is that a feature of the world? Uh, or is it due to our, is it a reflection of our means of understanding the world? I mean, our theories of the world are also expressed in English and in German. That's not because of the way the world is. Uh, that's a reflection of our speaking English or German. Is the mathematical characters, characterizability of them, is that like the characterizability of them in English and German and is to be understood in terms of us? Or is that a feature of the things in themselves? I said, I want to be agnostic as to whether that's actually Kant uh, who's doing that. Uh, my hero Hegel thought that was Kant. Uh, Sellers thought that that was Kant. Uh, it, that idea lives on in Sellers in the distinction between the world in the narrow sense that's described and the world in the wider sense that, if you look at that, the end of that passage 18, consists, also includes norms that are only accessible from a participant perspective. And which, think of an earlier passage, if you describe them, you describe only their bones, not the lived rule in our practices. This is a reflection of uh, a division between the noumena and the phenomena. What, uh, 
the world is responsible for and what in some sense we're adding to it. Uh, the big idea of Sellers' Locke lectures of science and metaphysics is that uh, the contemporary successor to Kant's transcendental idealism sees a world as described and explained by science as the noumena, as necessarily for us embedded in a life world of persons and norms, which are the appearances that we're responsible for. That's the you know, transcendental idealism. Oh, full disclosure, I think this is a terrible idea. If it was Kant's idea, it was a bad idea. Uh, now, Hegel thought it was Kant's idea and it was a bad idea. Uh, and to be in the business, to be about the business of trying to sort out what the world is responsible for and what we're responsible for in something that you think of as the interaction of them, you've already gone off the rails uh, at that point. And, well, anyway, I'm merely expressing it at, the, at this point, what might as well be just a prejudice, though I will try to say something about it. Uh, but, but that Kantian idea, like the idea of the normative, normative, essentially normative character of discursiveness and uh, the existence of frame explicating concepts that are not descriptive or explanatory, that play this other crucial role. Those are good ideas that we desperately need. But Sellers also had took over from Kant this third idea that, that I want to say is just, it's a really bad idea. Um, OK, that's sort of where I'm going uh, with this Kantian background. Let me say something about the uh, inheritance of this. So I made you a picture because these guys are not um, as well known as uh, some other philosophers are. And you know, very quickly there was a back to Kant movement, zurück nach Kant, uh, from Kuno Fischer in 1860. There had been a wave of Hegelianism uh, that receded, uh, and Fisher, who was the first one really to read Kant as principally a philosopher of science, uh, Michael Friedman in our own day is the one who says, "Look, the center of uh, the center of." Kant's thought and achievement is he was brilliant to the point of genius, a brilliant philosopher of 18th century science. Uh, and the limitations of bringing his thought forward are it was 18th century science that he was a brilliant philosopher of, philosopher of not anything since. Really. But Fisher was the first to read him that way and say, look, this, this is what we need. This is what we should be doing. Uh, and the principal um, proponents of this neo-Kantian revival, uh, roughly in the last 40 years of the 19th century, were these two schools, uh, geographical, one in Marburg, one in Freiburg. Uh, the, the Freiburgians were thought of as Southwest or Baden neo-Kantians. Uh, and that was an, of the older generation, Windelbond, and slightly younger, Heinrich Rickert. Uh, and in Marburg, uh, the older, Hermann Cohen, uh, and the younger, Paul Nator. Uh, of them, at least Cohen and Windelbond, the the first generation, 
appreciated this normative turn of Kant. And in my view, uh, the, the young Cohen and middle Windelband actually went a long way to rationally reconstructing Hegel without realizing that that's what they were doing because the picture of Hegel they had was downstream from you know, the way people in Germany were thinking about Hegel in those days. Uh, he didn't leave any first-rate students who studied the logic and the metaphysics. They only cared about the social and political thought. From my point of view, they didn't have a clue what Hegel was doing. Uh, these guys laboriously reinvented it, but didn't recognize it as Hegelian. But they were doing the same thing to Kant that Hegel was doing. I just mentioned that in passing. <coughs> but uh, Fischer was the older colleague of Frege. Uh, everything Frege knows about Kant, he learned from Fischer. And that's how. Uh, about half of what he says about Kant, the rest of it just isn't true. Uh, but you know, he was a mathematician, not a not a philosopher. Uh, but you know, what he knew, he was getting from uh, Fisher. Uh, Rickards was the doctor father of Bruno Bau, who was Frege's best buddy um, uh, in his uh, Yena years. Uh, and Rickert was also the doctor father of Heidegger. Uh, Carnap uh, studied with Bauch uh, and attended Frege's uh, lectures. He's in this neo-Kantian uh, tradition. The Marburgians left, sort of the la fathered the last neo-Kantian the way the school is usually thought of, Ernst Kassirer. Uh, and I just point out that in the 20s, we get this, um, uh, th this pair of debates, uh, Heidegger fighting his neo-Kantian past in uh, Kassirer and Davos, um, and Carnap having a dispute with Heidegger over metaphysics as opposed to good, hard-headed empiricism over uh, uh, Heidegger's utterance, proclamation das nichts, nicht it, nothing nuts or nothings, um, which was a paradigm of meaningless metaphysics from his point of view. Uh, what? Sellers discovered in 1946 and 1947 is that although Carnap thought of himself as not a Kantian at all, in fact, he was a neo-Kantian, if you had eyes to see it. And having eyes to see it showed Sellers the way forward the way to bring uh, Kant into the contemporary discussion. Now, the other uh, thread coming in, neo-Kantian thread, uh, is through American pragmatism. Uh, Peirce was a serious student of Kant. It's sort of hard to remember, hard for me to remember, that um, Peirce was no more historically removed from Hegel than we are from Sellers now. And it was a relatively recent, you know, six, 50, 60 years now. Uh, years ago. Uh, and Dewey was a serious student of Hegel, naturalizing Hegel. Um, the star student of uh, William James 
and the Harvard Hegelian Josiah Royce uh, was C.I. Lewis. And he was a Kantian. Uh, in particular, his book, Mind and the World Order, and his later book, uh, Analysis of Knowledge and Valuation, are updatings of Kant in an empiricist mode. Uh, Lewis, in turn, was a teacher of both Sellers during his Harvard years and Quine. Quine, indeed, had his dissertation officially directed by Whitehead, who was the logician co-author of Principia Mathematica with Russell, who had moved to Harvard, and C.I. Lewis, who was the founder of formal modal logic in uh, the teens. But uh, Quine was sneaking off and consorting with Carnap, who was not respectable at Harvard circles at that point. Uh, we now have the Quine Carnap correspondence, Dear Carnap, Dear Van, has been published. It's, it's interesting to look at. Uh, and it was Carnap who opened Seller's eyes to what he ca called the new way of words. That was a conversion experience for him. C.I. Lewis was the only one in this tradition who was struggling to keep Kant in the canon and taught a famous and famously influential course in the first critique at Harvard <coughs> to generations of philosophers and given how central Harvard was in the uh, American philosophical scene in those years, basically everybody took this course. Uh, which went sort of sentence by sentence through it as far as the B deduction. It didn't get any farther than that, but there's good stuff <laughs> uh, there. And that course was still, you know, versions of that course are still being taught sort of downstream from C.I. Lewis. These streams come together in Sellers. Quine is no kind of a Kantian. What he got from C.I. Lewis and Carnap is empiricism, not uh, Kant. Sellers is the neo-Kantian of his generation. And if he's right, Carnap did not manage to break free from the neo-Kantianism of his teachers. He just didn't know enough about Kant to recognize his own neo-Kantianism. just mention as a um, as an aside because it matters to me uh, I've written I've published two pieces about uh, being in time and they're the basis of my understanding of the they articulate my understanding of the early Heidegger uh, some years after the first one was published, uh, Brune Christensen, who's uh, an Australian specialist in the neo-Kantians, uh, he and I were at a conference together and he said, you know, interesting reading of the early Heidegger, you realize that what you've done is carefully pick out everything in this early work of Heidegger that was due to his teacher, Rickard, uh, that he had not yet freed himself from, and which was the reason when Heidegger looked back at being in time, he said, it's an early merely anthropological work and of no philosophical value at all. Uh, and I've come, you know, Brun has convinced me that he's right about this, that I was seeing fascinating philosophy through the lens of Heidegger, but what I was seeing was his teachers, his neo-Kantians, and it was exactly those features that he repudiated in his care and in moving on. Well, insidious neo-Kantianism, that's all I'm saying, you can't, 
be sure whether you have been infected or not. Uh, however sincere you are, you might not, you might not be right. Okay. Uh, now I want to say something about the development of Seller's thought, his um, career, and culminating in saying something about what his great revelation was uh, in 1946-47 uh, that got him going. So uh, I will in subsequent uh, sessions talk more about Seller's father, Roy Wood Sellers. But he was one of the most prominent philosophers of his generation uh, and was the, for most of his career, the chairman of the Michigan Philosophy Department. Uh, Sellers describes spending summers with his father, uh, his father on the third floor of their house in Ann Arbor, Sellers on the second floor. Uh, Sellers, born in 1912, published not a word until 1947. Uh, so he's 35 years old, uh, has been in academia for 10 years, uh, and has not published anything. And his father, the author of 15 books, in the autobiographical reflections, Sellers describes what it was like to spend the summer staring at a piece of paper and hearing from above, tap, 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 as his father just wrote chapter after chapter of the next book that uh, he was doing in Sellers. couldn't write anything. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, sort of is in, has been instructive to me and uh, I would hope would be even more resonant for younger people is the vicissitudes of the career of this great philosopher. You know, he started off with this uh, intimidating father, uh, William James and Henry James uh, also had their father, the Swedenborgian philosopher, uh, whose shadow they had to come out of. Uh, uh, Wilfred did too. He got some advantages. When he was nine, he was taken out of the public schools because his father got a two-year sabbatical. And they spent the winter in New England, the summer in Oxford, and the next year in Paris, where Sellers was, as a 10 or 11-year-old, just thrown into the lycée uh, there. Uh, he would return uh, when he was 15 or a year, uh, so we're now talking 1930. Um, well, anyway, 29 or 30, I think, is when he did a year at the Lycée Louis Le Grand, which uh, a fabled institution in Paris. The claim is that the best academic careers never leave this block of Paris that has the Lycée Louis Le Grand uh, on it, uh, the Sorbonne, uh, the Maine, and the Collège de France. That the proper career, you do your high school at the Lycée Louis Le Grand, the way Sartre and Camus, for instance, uh, did. Uh, you go on to the Sorbonne and then finally to the Collège de France. We had a Sellers conference in Paris a few years ago and went and looked at his class portrait at the Lycée Louis Le Grand. He missed by one year in each direction overlapping with Sartre and with Camus. Uh, they, they were in other classes just you know, we hadn't known until we saw this this picture because they were all about the same age and they there is this like the picture of Hitler and Wittgenstein in their elementary school class together but it was the Lycée Louis Le Grand of that uh, of that era 
And we have some of the explication de text that he wrote in the archive that, that he wrote there, including the first time he ever saw the phenomenology of spirit, uh, which was uh, reading excerpts of it in French and having to write a, a, a précis uh, of it. That's in the, in the archive there. And then he spent the summer in uh, Munich working on his German. Uh, came back, uh, took his undergraduate philosophy degree at uh, Michigan, working with his father, uh, and did uh, an MA at Buffalo, uh, working with Marvin Farber on Husserl's phenomenology. And one of the things I put in the um, uh, course website is we've only recently recovered his mass that he wrote in 1934. So he was 22. And we have this. Um, it's worth looking at. Uh, it's sort of all dead all the time. His father was known for critical realism and evolutionary natural. And boy, do those ideas come up in this uh, master's thesis. Uh, Sellers was an athlete, uh, principally a wrestler, but also uh, a formidable fencer. And he got a Rhodes Scholarship to go to Oxford and went to Oxford in uh, the early 30s, uh, got a B-fill, uh, and was admitted to the doctoral program. They, they were impressed enough with him to let him into the doctoral program. Uh, and uh, the DPhil there, this is just the dissertation. Uh, he was working with Weldon, T.H. Uh, Weldon, to write a Kant dissertation, uh, a dissertation on uh, the transcendental deduction. Uh, he failed. He was not able to write uh, a dissertation. Uh, learned a lot about uh, the Oxford philosophers, but couldn't write that dissertation. Came back, uh, went to Harvard, entered their doctoral program, working with Quine, who though he was uh, essentially the